Hello everyone and welcome to GI Research on the Road. This program is sponsored by the International Foundation for Gastrointestinal Disorders. Today we are speaking with Dr. Matthew DeMagno and GI dietitian Amanda Dixon who are both from the University of Michigan, live at Food the Main Course to Digestive Health in Ann Arbor. Each of our participants passionately provides care for patients who suffer from functional gastrointestinal and motility disorders. Today we will learn about the role of pancreatitis in GI disorders. Sometimes GI disorders can develop due to complications of another condition that may also affect the way our bodies digest food. Dr. DeMagno and dietitian Amanda Dixon will help us understand what pancreatitis is, how it can affect the digestive tract, and how patients can manage pancreatitis with medical or dietary approaches. So we'll start with you, Dr. DeMagno. What is pancreatitis? What is the current process in diagnosing someone with this condition? I generally outline the disease as two conditions, but you can split that into more. First, with acute pancreatitis, uh, I would uh, define that uh, according to the Atlanta criteria as patients having at least two of three features. Most commonly, severe upper abdominal pain, often radiating to the back. Uh, elevations in pancreatic enzymes measured in the blood is usual but not uh, exclusive. And third, if you see evidence of inflammation on CT, MRI, or ultrasound imaging. So those are the three features that you're looking for when you're trying to diagnose acute pancreatitis. With chronic pancreatitis, the diagnosis uh, is a fundamental challenge because many of the features that you're looking for often don't show up for several years. Uh, it's important in that setting to try to standardize your approach and there are different types of criteria you can use but most of them have the same features and what you're looking for is typical symptoms, upper constant or recurrent abdominal pain, can be weight loss or recurrent attacks of pancreatitis. Secondly, evidence of uh, imaging changes. Um, third, calcifications that you can see in the gland, fourth, diabetes, five, um, decrease in pancreatic digestive function, and rarely do we have histology. So there are a combination of ways you can make that diagnosis, but those in general are the features that we're looking for. If you don't see it during the initial evaluations, you continue to look to help support or negate the possibility that patients may have chronic pancreatitis. Thank you for that explanation. So to build on that, how might an individual with or without chronic GI disorders be impacted if they are diagnosed with pancreatitis? Well, this also <clears throat> uh, is similar to my uh, prior response, is that with acute pancreatitis versus chronic pancreatitis, what to expect can differ. With acute pancreatitis, the vast majority of patients have a self-limited attack. You identify the cause, you treat the cause, and they're done. That being said, there are several exceptions. Some patients may have severe disease, a protracted course, and can develop complications. Uh, it may end up leading them to be in the hospital a long time or come back into the hospital. Uh, secondly, there are patients who either have had a mild or, re or severe course, uh, and after discharge can have recurrent attacks, possibly because of an overlooked cause or perhaps because of early chronic pancreatitis that we only see evolve over time. So those patients who come back into the hospital or who have a prolonged course can require a, a number of resources in their care, but this can also adversely affect their family, uh, their ability to work, uh, their overall health, uh, and also their family. Now, chronic pancreatitis is a little bit different. Those patients can have uh, uh, recurrent attacks at varying intervals from months to uh, uh, years and uh, it, so it can have a lesser or a greater impact on their life. Uh, those factors I mentioned in terms of work, uh, health insurance, overall uh, health. There are others who have chronic daily pain uh, and in that situation what to expect kind of depends on what's driving that. If there's a well-defined anatomic cause that can be intervened on, then those patients may have the promise of moving on and having a fully functioning, pain-free life. If it's more complicated and happens to involve uh, 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 neuropathic pain, uh, pain involved in nerves or pain uh, changes in pain processing in the brain, 
that can be a very uh, a much more difficult problem to manage. Thank you for pointing out all the differences and the varying degrees that can occur in pancreatitis. I think that's very important to know and understand for, for patients. Um, so what are some of the current medical management plans and are there any new advancements being made in research that you're aware of? Well, I think I break the at least the management down into four areas. There could be more, but beginning with pain, um, you know, that this the, the pain management will depend on what you believe is driving this. Uh, if there is, for, uh, and I'm speak, uh, speaking specifically about chronic pancreatitis, so if the pain is arising from an anatomic cause, compression of some organ, a stricture of some organ, uh, uh, you know, perhaps there can be a uh, procedure that can help to relieve that pain. If it has to do with neuropathic pain uh, uh, involving the, the peripheral nerves or the brain or the spine, uh, that can be more challenging, require uh, uh, involvement of specialist expertise uh, with expertise in pain. Uh, that's a prolonged process. There is evidence out there though in randomized controlled data suggesting that pain neuromodulation with available medications can reduce the, the, the number of painful days per month. Uh, in terms of digestion, pancreatic insufficiency, uh, that's another standard um, a part of what we do, including uh, so monitoring for nutritional deficiencies, so putting patients on appropriate dose of pancreatic enzymes is important after you do the test and confirm that they have excrement pancreatic insufficiency if they continue to have uh, problems with digestion, persistent fat in the stools, decline in their weight, or other symptoms, you'd have to raise the question about whether other factors are involved. Uh, timing of uh, the medications, dose of the medications, uh, do they need to be on uh, an acid blocker to protect the enzymes? Do they have other things like bacterial overgrowth? which is uh, something that we also reported on in our recent study showing a very high prevalence of bacterial overgrowth in this patient population. Uh, diabetes is also uh, uh, another uh, manifestation of chronic pancreatitis, and that can come on later on in the course. This is a difficult thing to manage because patients can be prone to high blood sugar, but also low blood sugar. So the, ver the, the treatments uh, that are recommended include metformin and insulin, but the insulin is a double-edged sword because it uh, can predispose the patients to low blood sugar. So having an expert diabetologist involved in your care is going to be very important. Um, I think that uh, sums up the major management. Yeah, thank you so much for it. That was a great explanation of all the different resources and that are available to patients with varying degrees of, of pancreatitis. So now that we've explained what pancreatitis is and the management plans available, um, we'll shift to you, Amanda. Um, for someone who has been diagnosed with pancreatitis, what type of adjustments can they safely make with their diet? So some adjustments they can safely make right away without the help of a dietitian is to tor lean towards more of a Mediterranean diet. So choosing more fruits and vegetables, reducing their intake of red meat, um, getting whole grains in. That's really the goal, and then reaching out to get a referral to speak with a dietitian if possible. Thank you. And on top of that, are there any foods that someone with pancreatitis, um, I know you said about the red meats, anything else in particular they should try to stay away from? They should try to stay away from processed meats, red meats, obviously avoiding alcohol and smoking are things that we strongly advise to be staying away from. And you said those are the easy changes to do without discussing with a dietitian, but what are some ways they can seek support from a dietitian that are beneficial to those who suffer from pancreatitis and other GI disorders? Um, working with a dietitian helps customize a one-on-one -on -one plan that works best for the patient's lifestyle and incorporate other things because some patients with pa chron or chronic or acute pancreatitis also have celiac disease or they might have bacterial overgrowth. So we want to customize a nutrition plan that incorporates all those different aspects. So if they have celiac disease, we want to make sure they are following a strict gluten-free diet as well as monitoring their fat, their high fat intake and you know making sure they're abstinent to alcohol. That's great. Thank you for pointing out the need for the all-inclusive diet and making sure that, that all the needs are met. That's absolutely important and great information for our patients to know. 
So we're here at the last day of Food the Main Course Digestive Health in Ann Arbor. So could you share with uh, us and any patients who might be watching some of the important um, takeaways and topics from this weekend? Um, so some key little points I found very interesting was that peppermint oil has been proven time and time again to help improve symptomatic abdominal pain and nausea. So that is a safe and effective management for abdominal pain. Um, a lot of patients that are in remission with, of IBD, about 20% still have clinical symptoms. Um, so coming and seeking out a dietitian would be beneficial at that time. And then lastly, be very mindful if you are planning to start a probiotic. You know, make sure you're always telling your medical providers of any vitamins, minerals, or probiotic supplements that you're taking because they could not be beneficial and actually could cause some harm. Thank you. Do you have any topics as well? Yes, I, I have some, uh, some brief comments. I, I think an important point I emphasize uh, with the patients is uh, some of the comments that we've seen in the uh, irritable bowel syndrome lectures that, that many of these treatments uh, relevant for treating patients with irritable bowel syndrome also can sometimes be very useful when you're trying to manage symptoms in patients who have pancreatic diseases. They're just like other people, they can also have some components of uh, functional bowel disease. Uh, the second uh, the point is that some of the nutritional uh, problems in some of these other gastrointestinal diseases are also relevant to uh, managing nutrition in chronic pancreatitis. For example, celiac disease, um, the uh, impaired absorption of nutrients in the small intestine, uh, that's something to consider also in patients with pancreatitis because celiac disease is a risk factor for chronic pancreatitis. Another part of digestion um, uh, is uh, highlighted with the inflammatory bowel disease uh, uh, lectures in that those patients can have inflammation at the bottom of the small intestine. That's where your bile acids are reabsorbed. And if you develop bile acid deficiency because of bile acid malabsorption, that's another factor to consider when you're trying to manage digestion of patients with chronic pancreatitis. So I think what these lectures really help to do is uh, reinforce one another and showing different ways about how digestion in the GI tract can go awry. Thank you. Thank you both so much for sharing such great information. We've really enjoyed each talk and all the new information learned this weekend. Um, it has really been great to catch up with some of the leading experts, such as yourselves, and being able to update our patient community on these very interesting and important topics to them. So thank you everyone for watching GI Research on the Road today. And many thanks again to our participants, Dr. DeMagno and GI dietitian Amanda Dixon, for taking the time to talk with us today about understanding the role of pancreatitis in GI disorders. We are very grateful for your willingness to share your unique insight with us today. Thank you. Thanks Thank very you. Much.